record of your life when you were bound by sin. And I know your darkest secrets that you would never tell. What makes you think you don't deserve a place with me in hell? Shackled from sin and shame. 
choir. I'm thankful that when we come to Jesus, we can come to him just as we are. Would you stand with me all over the building as the choir is making their way down? First Thessalonians chapter 4 uh, this morning, First Thessalonians chapter 4, and we're going to preach on this thought, the sorrow and the shout, the sorrow and the shout, and I thank God for the opportunity to be here with you this morning, and I thank the Lord to know that I'm saved, to know that I'm saved, to know that I'm not going to hell, and to know, to know that when this life is over, I am going to be in heaven with him. Paul said in 2 Corinthians, and we read this Wednesday night, that unless he be exalted above measure from great abundance of revelation, there were a lot of things when he was there in the desert, alone with Jesus after he got saved, that God revealed to him. 
And he revealed several things and he displays them here in the scriptures. And here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 is one of the mysteries that God used Paul to, to reveal to the church. He says this, usually he said, behold, he uses that phrase, behold, I show you a mystery. And wherever you see Paul saying that, he's telling you something that God has revealed to him. Now, Paul didn't get all the revelation. He gave some to Peter and he gave some to John, but he gave Paul some instruction when it came to what's going to happen in the Christian life. And this church in Thessalonica, they had some that had come and taught them that the resurrection is not real. There was a group of Jews that did not believe in the resurrection. They are the sad you sees. I remember that as a childhood song. That's why they're sad, you see. They don't believe in the resurrection. And they were beginning to teach the church in Thessalonica that there was no resurrection. But Paul starts in verse 13 and he says, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, those that have died. They came to Paul and Paul said you can have everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You can know eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And then unfortunately some of their loved ones have died. And they wrote to Paul and said tell us Paul what's going on. You said we would have everlasting life. And Paul writes this to answer their question. Listen to me. Paul tells them. Everlasting life and eternal life is given to you when you trust Christ as your Lord and Savior. But you're not going to live eternally down here. No, you don't want to live eternally down here. I want you to think I've lived on this earth for 42 years now. Going on 43 years. And this body is getting older. And this body is getting more wrinkled. And this body is getting more pain. And thank God I'm not staying on this earth in this body for eternity. But the Bible tells me I'm leaving this earth. I'm going to get a new body. I'm going to get a new home. I'm going to a new country. I'm going to a new world. Thank God I'm going to get out of this world. And I'm going to find myself in a new place. He said, so when those that you know and love know you know that they that have fallen asleep I want you to know some things about them so I want you to notice what he says in verse 13 and following he says but it would not have you to be ignorant brethren concerning them which are asleep that you sorrow not as others which have no hope what is that no hope thing that you're never going to see them again I'm going to see my saved loved ones again what a hope, what a guarantee, what a promise, what an exciting thing to know about your, the death of your loved one, that this is just a temporary separation. We are going to be together again, so Paul begins to explain it to them. He says in verse 14, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, that's salvation, even so them also which sleep or that have died in Jesus Will God bring with him? There is no soul sleep. The Bible says absent from the body, present with the Lord. When he uses the word sleep here, he's talking about those that have died. They are not asleep in the Lord. No, they're very much with him right now. That's what he says. He said, now God's going to bring them back, but he's going to bring them with him. How are you going to bring somebody with you if they're not with you? But your loved ones that have died, I want you to know, they're not in a casket somewhere. They're not in a grave somewhere. They're not, they're not asleep somewhere waiting for resurrection day. They are very much alive on the other side. But Paul described there's coming a day when the graves are going to burst open. There is coming a day when the body is going to be raised again. And he mentions it here in verse 15. He said, For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain, under the coming of the Lord shall not prevent or go before them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain will be called up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And I love this part. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. To never be separated again. You're not going to have to go up there and meet with them for a while. Say your goodbyes and go somewhere else. No, no. This is the end. This is when we're reunited with those loved ones that have gone on. This is when we see them. And 
we know that we're together with him in everlasting life, in eternity. And he said in verse 18, he said, but while you're there, while you're seeing your loved ones pass away, while you're bearing those that are dearest in your heart to you, he said, wherefore, comfort one another with these words, that it is not the end, that it is not the final death. Instead, you can say to your loved one, I'll see you in the morning. This is just a little while and then we'll be together again. And I tell you, I appreciate God giving Paul this explanation of what takes place in the life of a Christian and what's going to take place at the time of the rapture. But I want you to know while we live in this world, we are going to go through sorrow. I wish I could take it away. I wish I could remove it from your life, but I cannot. You can find a very simple uh, division here to what Paul is saying to them. He gives them in verses 1 through 12, chapters, uh, he gives to them in verses 1 through 12, he gives them a great word of ex exhortation. He explains to them about their responsibility, but that there is reward coming. And he gives to them in that explanation. When he gives to them ex that exhortation, he tells them what they are to do until the resurrection takes place. And then in verse 13 and following, he gives them the promise of that resurrection. And then in verse 13 and through 15, he gives them an explanation. What's going to take place? What is going to happen when Jesus comes again? Where their loved ones are and how they're going to be reunited with them. The Bible says here that this is a reality. Paul said, I didn't make this up. This is not something that comes from the Baptist denomination. This is not something I wrote as a preacher before I came in this pulpit. Paul said the, the Lord Jesus Christ himself gave me this word that when the resurrection takes place, this is how it's going to be. So we have the reliability in what Paul is saying. And we have the reality of what Paul is saying. If we live here... Until the rapture comes, we are all going to pass through death. But when the rapture comes, we can escape that experience of death and go up with him in the rapture. But do you realize most Christians that have been saved since the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, most Christians, 99.9% .9 of all Christians are going to die. There's a small percentage of Christians that are going in the rapture. Small, there'll be a small group that is on the earth. Not just a small group of Christians, but a small group of all Christians of all time. There are many that have passed from this death, in, from this uh, life into eternity through death. There is a well-worn path from heaven's gate down to the funeral homes and hospitals of this world. The shepherd has traveled it many times. And I just want to get you ready for the fact, the idea that the Bible tells us one message, one thing that you need to know. You are going to die, and you need to be ready to die. I was sad about what happened to Stephanie yesterday, but I'm rejoicing in where she is. Wednesday night, walking out of that walkway down there, she told me, she said, I guess I'll be like most diabetics. I'll, I'll probably have problems with my feet from now on, and I'll probably have to have surgery and a toe or two removed and partial foot, and maybe I'll eventually have to have my foot removed. And she said, I got this hip thing going on. I got this hip surgery going on, and, and I'm going to have to have that done. And she, I could see in her face she was dreading all that, and she said, I can't hardly move now, but I got news for you. She's running today all over the streets of glory. She was ready, though we did not know what was going to take place just a couple of days later, though we did not know what was going to happen yesterday. There was a shepherd that had already started his journey coming down to this earth to receive that mama and that grandmother into his arms and take her home to be with him. I'm glad God explained to us what takes place when our loved ones die. We've got the explanation of the reality. Death is coming to all men. I'm just sitting here telling you, when your mama dies, when your daddy dies, when your grandma dies, when your dog dies, don't you get mad at God. No. He told you they were going to die. Don't you get angry at God when your spouse dies. Don't get angry at God. He told you they were going to die. 
Instead, if they're saved, you ought to brag on God and rejoice in God to say, I got them here for a little while. I had them here on this temple side, but thank God mom and daddy are on the other side. I'm not mad at God. They may have died in a way that you didn't expect. They may have died suddenly like Stephanie yesterday, but it don't matter. I don't have them on this side anymore, but I got them on the other side, and this was temporary anyway, but I got them for eternity because they were saved. Thank God mom Mom and dad knew Christ as their Lord and Savior. Thank God Stephanie knew Christ. This is the reliability of it. I didn't make this up. Paul didn't make this up. He said, the Lord told me what takes place. Now, I guess the Lord knows. He's made, he's made more trips in and out of heaven than any of us. Amen. One man said to me, I was witnessing to him. And he said, how do you know heaven's real? I said, I know the one that's gone there. I know the one that's come from there. And I know the one that's gone back there. I know the one that's made it. Now, he was a World War II veteran. And he was talking to me about the places he fought in Iwo Jima. And I said, I'll tell you something. I said, I, I could sit here and say, I don't believe in Iwo Jima. I don't believe there's an island there that... Uh, I don't believe there's an island there. I don't believe there was ever a battle there. I didn't believe you fought in it. He said, well, I'm sitting here telling you it was there, describing it. And I said, I'm sitting here telling you what Jesus said, that Jesus came from, the, uh, from heaven, descended down from glory, died on the cross, ascended back. I believe if he knows the way, if anybody knows the way, Jesus knows the way. If you want me to believe in Iwo Jima and you're just a man, you ought to believe in heaven because Jesus was God. Yeah, hallelujah. Amen. He eventually got saved. Josh got to go to the, uh, the nursing home with me and watch him pray his heart and life into Christ. But what an explanation of the reality and reliability. I'm saved, but when I die, I don't know how it's going to happen. I've told you how I wanted it to happen in my late 90s. Somewhere along the way, I, without any sickness, or without, and this is the way you plan your death, without any sorrow, without any sickness, Boy, I'd love to be sitting in my living room and watch the Tar Heels beat the Duke Blue Devils one last time. And then just fall asleep, Greg, in that recliner, and then wake up on the other side. That's the way I planned it out. But you know what? I don't get to plan it. I'm not in control. If I die in a car crash, if I have a, a heart attack, if I go through years of cancer and suffering and pain, I just want to tell you I'm not mad at God. It don't matter to me. This pain and this suffering is just a light affliction on this side. But I'm going to the other side. I know, I know, I know in the reality of what God has said. He exhorts them, then he explains to them, and then he gives them just a little bit of expe expectation in verse 16 through 18. He said, for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first, then we, we which are alive and remain will be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with, the, with these words. We have an expectation of that day taking place. Have you not in your mind imagined what it's going to be like? Have you, not, have you not in your mind thought about what is it going to be like in just a moment? The Bible says in, in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul describes it again. He said, behold, I show you a mystery. And he talks about the fact that in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, I'm going to come up out of these clothes and there's going to be a pile of clothes left here. But in that moment, I'll be clothed upon with the righteousness of Christ and that white robe. And I'll take a flight faster than any airplane that's ever flown, faster than any bullet that's ever been fired. I'll take up off out of this place and I'll hear that wonderful trumpet sound. And when I leave this world in just a moment, I'll be wrapping my arms around the loved ones that I've seen go to the other side and I'll be wrapping in my arms around the feet of Jesus to be with him forever hallelujah what an expectation there ain't nothing you got going on this afternoon that's better than the rapture that's going to take place ain't a ball game in March Madness that's going to be better than this right here no sir uh -uh. Paul said Jesus said and the word of God tells us until that takes place you and I are going to have to go through sorrow this world is filled with sorrow. The older you get, you just start expecting it uh, to come along quicker and quicker. 
As a child, you don't have a whole lot of sorrow because you're sheltered. Your parents shelter you from a lot of the news stories. And you don't set up and watch Fox News like some of y'all do 24 hours a day looking for the next thing to happen. When you're a child, you watch, uh, you watch fairy tales on movies. And, and you've got all those things that you're involved in with a child. But even as a child, you go through some sorrow. There's a bully at school that makes fun of you. Your ears are too big. Your nose is too big. Your hair's not combed right. They don't like the way you look. They pick out something and... Kids can be cruel, can't they? Yeah. They make fun of you down at the schoolhouse. They don't like your name. They'll find something. And man, they'll just make you miserable until you get enough fight inside of you or a smart aleck mouth to, to come back with. It's, these kids, they find themselves uh, bullies and mean. And if that's not bad enough, kids, in a very young age, you may have a pet to die and experience the first sorrow of death you've ever gone through. Now then a grandmother dies and you experience the sorrow of death. Now I'd like to say that it slows down and it gets easy, but don't. The older you get, the more sorrow that you see. Our country goes through sorrow sometimes all at one time. When I guess the, the biggest event that I remember as a child is riding in my, uh, my mom's uh, Buick. And those velour, those brown velour seats. And I heard on the radio that President Reagan had been shot. I remember exactly where we were in Winston-Salem when I heard the news. And it wasn't long after that, the space shuttle exploded. And I was in, I was in Spanish class when Steve Hurst come running in and told Mr. Calhoun the space shuttle had just exploded and all the astronauts were killed. As a nation, when those planes hit those twin towers on 9-11, have we not as a nation gone through sorrow and experienced sorrow? But then we have found ourselves as a church going through sorrow. Like the death of Stephanie. We're going through this sorrow together. And I wish to tell you that this may be the only one this year, but I doubt it. I wish to tell you this may be the only one this week, but it may not be. God's in control, but that sorrow, you find yourself going through these ebbs and flows, moments of joy, church services where you shout it out, but funeral services where you cry it out. It seems like there's a little joy for a little while, and then there's more sorrow. And it's not just a church body, but your family goes through sorrow. A loved one gets sick, and you pray for them, and they get better, and then another loved one gets the call of cancer. Something happens in the family and somebody's in the hospital and they get better. And then another loved one. And your family seems to go through constant sorrow. The way a child is acting. The way a grandchild is acting. Someone on drugs. Someone addicted to drugs. It seems like sorrow has become a norm in our adult life. And I just want to tell you that's just part of the result of the sin of Adam and Eve in the garden. It's not God. God is not doing those things to hurt the human race. It's just because sin has cursed this earth and sorrow will be here until Jesus returns. We go through sorrow as individuals. We lose the closest on earth to us. Not just as a family, but as an individual. We go through sorrows. There are things this morning that are on your mind as burdens. There are worries that are in your heart. There are concerns. And it's all different for some of us. Some of us have financial worries and sorrows. And some of us have family worries and sorrows. And others have others at work. You're afraid you're going to lose your job. And it just seems like when you get over one sorrow, there's a little bit of joy, a little bit of victory. And then here comes another sorrow. And all that, I want you to know, don't get mad at God because you're going through those things. I've never heard somebody say, man, I'm mad at the devil. You ever hear him say that? No. Who do they get mad at? I always get mad at God. Why don't you get mad at the one that's the cause of all of this? Why don't you get mad at the one that's the reason because of all of this? No, people turn their attention toward God and say, I'm not going back to church. I'm not going to live for a God that would let that happen. Why don't you tell the devil, I know you're the reason for this. I'm not mad at God. I'm mad at the devil that's causing all this sorrow to take place in the world. And I want you to know, Jesus said to his disciples, he said, in this world, you're going to have sorrows. He said, you are going to be sorrowful. And while you're sorrowful, the world is going to rejoice at your sorrow. But he gave the disciples this promise in John chapter 16. He said, but your sorrow one day will be turned into joy. The sorrow that you know down here with intermittent times of joy is going to be changed. And you're going to a place that's going to be all joy and no sorrow anymore. Hallelujah. 
Thank God that there is an exit strategy for this sorrow. We know that sorrow comes because of disease. Paul was talking about Epaphroditus in Philippians chapter 2. And he said, for he longed after you all. He wanted to be with you all. And was full of heaviness because ye had heard that he had been sick. For indeed, he was sick nigh unto death. But God had mercy on him. Not only him, not only him also, but me also. Lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. Meaning, seeing Epaphroditus sick and then watching him die. Paul said, I didn't have sorrow on top of sorrow. Instead, God healed him and, and br brought him back into health. There's disease that brings sorrow. In the chapter we're reading, there's death that brings sorrow. There is despair that brings sorrow. In Psalms chapter 13, there's several places we can go. But in Psalms chapter 13, he says, David is calling out to the Lord. He says, how long Wilt thou forget me, O Lord, forever? How long wilt thou hide thy face from me? How long shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart daily? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? David's just being honest in his heart. God has not forgot about him. God has not can see him wherever he is. David knows and the answer, and you'll see it at the, uh, at the end of the chapter in Psalms chapter 13. David knows that what he's asking are really questions that he knows the answers to. But there are moments, there are times in our lives, there are circumstances and situations that we feel like God has forgot about us, that God's not listening to our prayers. It seems like the sorrows overwhelm us in those times and we're brought into deep despair because of the sorrow that we're going through but I want you to know God has not forgot about you how is an omniscient God going to forget about you no no he knows your name he knows your full name he knows your middle name he knows your mama's name your daddy's name he knows your DNA your hair color he knows how many hairs are upon your head today and has numbered every one of them that's how much care he has over you no he has not forgotten you and no he is listening to your prayers he's heard your prayers David said in this sorrow I feel like God has pulled his his presence away from me and I don't know how long I'm gonna go through this sorrow may I say this Christian there are times you're going to feel like that there are times in this world that sorrow is going to cause you to feel like I am desperate I'm in despair is God even paying attention and Peter said yes he's paying attention casting all your care upon him for he careth for you he's not forgotten about you he sees that your heart is low and as they sung just a moment ago Job said I cannot find God in this darkness Job said, in my experience, this darkness that is all around me, it just seems like God has disappeared. But God was in it the whole time. And by the end of Job, he starts to realize how foolish was it to think that God didn't know the darkness that I was in. The God that had taken care of me. The God that had heard me pray. The God that has saved me from the, uh, hell. The God that has redeemed my soul. How foolish is it for us to go through this world in our moment of despair to think that God will not keep his promises in his word. God is not a liar, but the one that's whispering in your ear those thoughts, he is a liar. Satan is a liar. And he's trying to cause you to doubt the God that's given you promises. That he'll hear your prayers. That he'll never leave you nor forsake you. And your, in your darkest days and your greatest moments of sorrow, thank God there's one there that knows what you're going through. And he can conquer that sorrow and despair in your heart. Hallelujah. Sorrow. Boy, I wish I had a way to take it away. I wish I did have a magic wand that I could wave as a pastor and remove sorrow. I can't do it. All I can do is give you the instruction from the Word of God that while you go through that sorrow, you hold on to the hand of a Savior who will never let you go. You trust in the heart of a benevolent God that has become your Father. And He's never, ever mistreated one of His children. And that God will carry you through that sorrow. Let's talk about the shout and we'll close. The shout. He said this. Verse 16. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a what? 
That sounded like a bunch of Presbyterians saying it. <laughs> the shout, you're not United Methodist, man. You're Independent Fundamental Baptist. I've never shouted in church. This is a good time for you to do it. When they have a wedding, before the wedding, they have a rehearsal. Everybody knows what they're supposed to say, what they're supposed to do. Everybody knows where they're supposed to stand and line up. You know what this world is? It's rehearsal for a wedding that we're going to. The Bible says that he shall descend uh, from heaven with a what? That's close. That's real close. That's, that's almost a cold, dead church. In a watch night service at 11.45. <laughs> Listen. We're going to leave here with a shout. So I'm not a shouter, preacher. I know that. Some of you are not. I am. I love shouting. But in the Holy Ghost, I tell you, if you take a God like we've got. And try to put it in a body like this. It's going to squeeze out somewhere. It's going to squeeze out in a hand wave. Or some of y'all will sit there and cry tears of joy. It's going to squeeze out in those tears. Or are you just going to let it go in a shout? Now this is what I've seen. I know, I know you don't shout. Some of y'all don't shout in, in church. But I've seen you shout. I have. I've seen some ladies when their children come in. And uh, a daughter come in and with, her, with her husband. And come in and say, Mom, I just want to let you know. We're pregnant. I've seen mamas come up off the couch. Woo! I'm having a grand baby. You do shout. You do shout. You know what that is? That's a shout of joy. That's what it's talking about. That this shout when Jesus comes back is the shout of joy. And you men sitting here, you, you sit there and caught for that little boy in the backyard. And he's pitched to you and he's tried to get that slider down. Or he's tried to get his knuckles right on that curved ball. And y'all have practiced and practiced. And you're sitting there watching that ball game. And that boy is facing one of the best hitters in his group or his class. And he gets that curved ball just right. And he fools him with that slider. And that guy strikes out. I've seen some dads jump up. That's it, boy. That's the way I told you to throw that ball. Yeah, you do shout. Shout of joy. When he's running down that field and that quarterback lets go of that ball and your boy catches it and catches that touchdown, boy, you jump off off those boys. Yeah, I see it. That's my boy right there. Do you see that? That's my son. I taught him how to do that. And that little boy, hey, they get on camera. It's funny to me in college. You know that dad's put in time and took them to basketball camps and football camps and all that stuff and that dad sitting there watching that boy do all the making those shots game winning shot in the NCAA tournament last second it goes through and that dad standing up that's my boy look at we've practiced we've been in the yard man I've watched him shoot a thousand free throws and the boy turns around looks at the camera and says hey mom <laughs> cracks me up every time We do have shouts of joy. This shout, I want you to know something about this shout. This shout is sure. Now when I come into a service, I don't know whether you're going to shout or not. I don't know whether you're a shouter or not. This shout is sure. It doesn't tell you who's shouting here. It does say the Lord himself is descending. And I just want to take a time out to say right there, he's not sending a valet angel. He's not sending Paul. I didn't believe in Paul. He's not sending Mary. Mary cannot save me. He's not sending Peter. Peter is not the one coming to get me. The Bible says the one I know, the voice that I know, the hand that has held me, there's a shepherd coming back to get me. The Lord himself. This is why when we see him, we'll know. I don't know Paul. I don't know Peter. I haven't seen Jesus. But boy, when he comes back, we'll know. That's him. That's the one. That's the one that I know. That's the voice with a shout. It doesn't say that the Lord's shouting. It doesn't say that the angels are shouting, but it's sure that there's going to be a shout. You know who I think shouting? I think it's us. I think it's a bunch of sorrow-filled saints that have believed that book and lived for that Lord and watch their babies go on and their grandbabies go on and grandma go on and church friends go on. I think it's mamas down here that have dusted and cleaned and Windex windows realizing we're going to a place where there'll be no dust. <laughs> no dust 
too corrupt, lazy. To, ladies, tell me something. When you see him and realize that Swiffer, you can put it up forever. You tell him you're not going to shout a little bit. Woo! No more vacuuming the carpets. No more keeping that house clean. No more dusting. No more sweeping. No more. When you see him and realize I'm getting ready to go see mama and daddy. I'm getting ready to go see my brothers and sisters. When you hear that trumpet, it is not going to be scary at all. It's not going to have any fear in it at all. When you hear that trumpet, I believe the mamas and ladies at our church that, that are born again, those ladies are going to shout and say, that's it. It's over. It's over. It's over. It's over. It's over. And dads, we worry about finances and life insurance, and we worry about you're my age. You worry if something happens to you, is your wife going to be okay if you, if you die earlier than retirement, and if you die earlier than you're able to get Social Security, and you start thinking about those things, and you carry that weight around with you, and you worry about your kids. Even if they're adults, you worry about them riding up down the road, and, and uh, accidents happen, you worry about... Uh, car tires and you worry about uh, insurance and you've got all that you've been carrying that stress on you and, and all that's weighing on you and you've wondered about Russia and what Russia's doing and what China's doing and all that money we're giving to the Ukraine and what's going to happen in America and, and, and can we turn this thing around and can we vote somebody in that would have some answers and you carry that around with you and it weighs on you and that sorrow uh, burdens you down and then in a moment the skies roll back as a scroll and there stands the nail scarred hand Savior are you telling me as a daddy you're not going to say hallelujah it's over I don't care what Russia does anymore I don't care what China does anymore I don't have to worry about the insurance anymore I don't have to worry if, if social security is going to be there or if Medicare is going to pay the hospital bill I'm leaving this world and I'm going to leave it with him hallelujah That shout is sure. Boy, I hope I get beside some of the people that I preach to. Some of y'all, our church is real good to pay attention. Very few times do I find somebody falling asleep. I do every once in a while. I don't point them out. I'm not being mean. I don't know. They may have had a long night. They took extra medicine this morning. I don't know. But I've seen some people sit there with their arms folded. <laughs> if you have your arms folded, I'm not talking about you. But I've seen some people come in and it's just like, all right, choir, bless me if you can. I've had a hard week and I ain't, I ain't letting nothing take away the misery I'm living in. Have you met Christians like that? They just suck the joy right out of the room when they come in. They're going to complain about something before they leave. I've watched some Christians, I mean, they just determined you ain't going to get me to that altar. I am not going to shout. I'm not going to smile. I'm not going to act like I'm enjoying this at all. Preacher, give it your best shot today. I'm ready for you. I won't be right beside of you when the rapture takes place. And I hear you shout. Woo! I'll look at you and say, man, you should have done that down there. You'd enjoyed it a lot better. It's sure, though. There's going to be a shout. Now this trump is not the seventh trump of tribulation. This is not the seventh trump of revelation. Paul describes it when he explains another mystery. He said at the last trump. The, trump is, uh, the shout is not only sure, but the shout is sudden. In a moment, he said, in the twinkling of an eye, in the Greek, that moment means in the smallest measurable time. Now for us, it's seconds, but now they've got to where they can measure milliseconds. And he clarifies it, and he says, in the twinkling of an eye. That's not a blink. That's that one little moment where light will reflect off of your eye and disappear. Jesus said, as lightning flashes across the sky, that's how sudden the rapture is going to take place. That's how quick Jesus is going to return. There's going to be a shout. And he said, at the last trump. How do you organize an army of five or six thousand men? How do you organize an army of twenty or thirty thousand soldiers? They had different songs they would play. 
different trumpet sounds that they would make. Many of you in the military, you got up to Reveille and you went to bed to taps. And we have, uh, we have ways to let the soldiers know when it's chow time. And they had a trumpet they would blow when it was time to eat. They had a trumpet they blow when it was time to go to war. But the last trump was named because it was the trump that they blew before they went home. Paul said there's a trump coming one day. It's the last trump. And that trump's going to tell you, pick up the tent stakes, boys. Pack up. We're going home. This thing's over with. And I'm telling you, when that thing happens in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, aren't you glad? Aren't you glad you ain't got a pack to go to heaven? Hallelujah. My wife would never get done. No. She saw me packed to go off for two days at the Jubilee. <laughs> and I mean, I just grabbed up some clothes, threw them in a suitcase and closed it up and went out the door. I thought, whatever I need, they got down at Walmart. I can get it down there. Her. Oh, well. I'm going to get in trouble, ain't I? She had one suitcase on the cruise, just had shoes in it. We have to weigh it so we don't have to pay the extra cost for the, the poundage. Forty pounds of shoes. Yeah. I know, Thomas. I know. I feel your pain, brother. Suddenly. Suddenly. You don't have to go to a waiting room. <laughs> Suddenly, that trumpet's going to sound. It's going to be the prettiest sound you've ever heard. And you realize, oh, this is it. I don't have to wait in the TSA line. I don't have to go down there and be, uh, I don't have to be inspected. I don't have to put my luggage through the belt. This is it. I'm taking the greatest flight that man has ever known, leaving this earth, and I'm taking off. And that shout, that shout that is sure, and that shout that is sudden, I believe that you and I are going to be so overwhelmed with joy that when we leave this earth, we are going to let out a shout. It's going to be the church leaving this world saying, Hallelujah, it's over. Hallelujah, the sorrow is ended. There'll be no more death. There'll be no more dying. There'll be no more crying. There'll be no more pain. You're telling me you're not going to shout about that? Oh, yes. We're going to leave this world with a shout. The sorrow for us is going to be ended. The sorrow for the lost is just beginning. Their sorrow will never end. Do you realize that the very worst day that you'll live on this earth is the worst day that you will ever, 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 ever live? There is a heaven coming. But for an unsaved person, the very best day they can live on this earth is the best day that they'll ever live. I have not even lived my best day yet. That guy wrote that book, Your Best Life Now. I don't want my best life now. Man, even at my best, there's a sorrow in my heart. There's a, there's a concern on my mind. And I want to tell you this lastly. That shout is going to happen soon. It's not just sure. It's not going to just be suddenly. It's going to happen soon. We've been going through this in the book of Revelation in this world. All the prophecies for the rapture to take place, all of them have been fulfilled. All of them. We'll talk about this in the series on Revelation, there are some prophecies that still have to be taken place for the second coming. That's different. That's when Jesus comes back to the earth. And the rapture, he comes in the clouds. And that, that could take place at any moment. And when it happens, I believe it's, it's going to happen soon and it's going to happen suddenly. We're leaving here with a shout. And our sorrow will be turned into joy. I've wept over the loss of my dad. I guess that's the closest people. Teague and them. Closest people. I had a gra my grandmother's passed away. And I was close to my grandmother's. but I've sorrowed over that. Mom. Last year, I don't know why. It hit. Those of you that have lost a loved one know what I'm talking about. Grief can just show up at any time. You just don't know when it's going to hit. This year... On my birthday, I just thought it. I'm not going to get a call from mom. I missed her so much that day. Sorrow. I've wept tears. I've missed her voice. I've missed my dad. 
boy, when this takes place, when that trumpet sounds, all that sorrow is going to drop off and they'll, they'll be again. There'll be that little short, skinny, bald-headed, well, I don't know if it'll be bald-headed in heaven. But there'll be that, there'll be dad and there'll be that little five foot two mom and she'll have black curly hair then and a young face and a new body. And all that sorrow I'm going through now, James, it'll be turned immediately. It's going to be turned into joy because there they are. There they are. I have them back. And we're going to be together for eternity. They got a new body. We're going to get a new heaven. We're going to get a new earth. If you're not saved this morning, this could happen before I finish this invitation. Jesus could come again. Don't put it off. Get saved today. Get born again today. You say, I'll preach it maybe a thousand years. It may be. It may be. But you can't take that chance. When Stephanie got in her car to go to that birthday party Saturday, she had no idea before the date changed that she was going to be in heaven. But if you know Stephanie, she knew the Lord. She made that reservation a long time ago. Didn't know the date of the journey, but she knew where she was going. When I prayed, when Travis called me, I begged God to keep that mama alive and that grandmother alive. And when I got down to the hospital and Travis said she's gone, I knew that I couldn't do anything else and they're getting ready to go through sorrow. But boy, what a day it's going to be. When the trumpet sounds. Wouldn't that be a glad day? Stephanie's been gone less than 24 hours. And the trumpet sounds. And that family is reunited in heaven. And there's that son and that daughter and those grandboys. And the grandbabies all around grandma again. And they they haven't been gone but 24 hours. I'm telling you there is something great to knowing the Lord. Whether it's it's for a day or 10 years or a thousand years. It's greater to know Him. And know that when I die I'm going to heaven to be with Him. Sorrow and and shout. If you don't get saved, all you're going to know is the sorrow of this life and then the sorrow of hell. But if you get saved, you'll know the sorrow of this life, but that sorrow is going to end at the shout. And the joy is going to rush in and there'll never be sorrow again. You'll go to a place where there'll be no more Your sorrow will turn into joy. Thank you for watching the service right here at Temple Baptist Church online. If there was a part of today's service that ministered to you in a certain way and you would like to reach out to us, please do that. You can do that by our address here. Many people write us here every week, and you can do that at 3615 Rockford Street, Mount Airy, North Carolina, 27030, or you can call us here. Feel free to go on our website or on any of our YouTube channels or go back into the archives of our Facebook page and check out any of our services. But maybe the message today captivated your heart or maybe it convicted you in a way where you would like to have prayer. Maybe something is uh, bothering you in your mind or in your own home life there that you would like prayer with. Call us here at the church office. We would love to pray with you right there in your home. Whatever you need, I believe that the Lord can give it to you. Would you bow your head right there where you are and pray with us as we close today's service? Father, in Jesus' name, I want to thank you for everyone today that is watching today's service. Out of every place and every service they could have went to, you let them be a part of our service online. And I want to thank you for them. I want to pray that you would bless them this week indeed. I pray that you would enlarge their coast. I pray that you would keep them from evil. And I want to pray, God, that their family would be abundantly blessed. I want to pray for the sick. I want to pray for those that are dealing with the loss of loved ones. I want to pray, Lord, that whatever is going on in their heart, life, and mind, that you would touch them this week and give them a week of peace, a week of hope, and a week of joy. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you and have a great week. God bless you.